Okay, well, th thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me and for all of you to, to come. Uh, so, uh, I'm from computer science, but this talk is really about uh, neuroscience. So, I'm going to talk about the connection between computer science and, and neuroscience. And the uh, first thing I want to uh, convince you of is that this connection is a kind of a very natural and obvious one. And one which has been uh, there from the, from the beginning. Um, so in very general terms, uh, some of you may be computer scientists, some may be neuroscientists, and most of you are something else, so I'll start with uh, some very general uh, thoughts. Um, so how does new computer science uh, make a contribution to, to another field, say biology? Um, so the answer is, this is a very simplistic answer, but the simplistic answer is that computer science, uh, above all, is a theory of what's a mechanism. So what's a procedure, what's a, a recipe. Um, so for example, in the 19th century, when people discussed Darwinian evolution, the question was, you know, was that a mechanism? What's a mechanism? Um, so, um, so computer science offers a theory of mechanisms. And its most famous format is, of course, that of, of Turing, who, who suggested a very particular definition of a mechanism, which is a Turing machine. And he also hypothesized that everything which is a mechanism is something which doesn't require creativity, it's a routine, a uh, logical prescription, um, is equivalent to something which uh, is his, uh, his Turing machine. So it's a, it's a definition of the space for mechanisms in, in computers, biology, psychology, economics, everything. Okay. So. Um, so if the brain, evolution, and biology, or any, anything else in the natural world uh, are not computations, uh, then in this sense, uh, Turing's thesis is just wrong. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you think that this computational approach to, say, neuroscience is some speculative theory, uh, you shouldn't think that way, OK? <laughs> the bigger picture would be that if, for example, a neuroscientist discovered that there is some mechanism in the brain which is somehow more powerful than what the Turing machines are, then that would be real news because that would destroy the foundations of computer science. Okay, so um, so that's how you should how you should think think of it. That uh, from the beginning, computer science had this incredibly ambitious program. program. It's going to explain mechanisms in all areas of, of, of science, and uh, maybe it failed, but uh, it's, at the moment, it's one of the best uh, accepted uh, theories in science. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, so, of course, Turing's theory is very general. So what's happened since is that people have analyzed uh, Turing's model in the light of constraints. So the idea is that computing forever isn't very practical. So you also have to measure the cost of computing, how many steps you take, uh, how much resources you use. And uh, this is what's been under study for many decades. Um, so if you want to apply this kind of science to some natural phenomenon, then most basically, you may have a, a computational explanation of, say, how the brain works, how the brain computes something. And the first thing it has to do, this computational mechanism, is to be truthful to reality. So if your suggested mechanism takes a billion years to finish on some model like the brain, then it's the wrong theory because the brain works faster. OK, so very, very roughly, this is the um, um, justification of why uh, the right base to study, right? Approach to neuroscience is from the computational perspective. And uh, so this is the new observation. So Turing had this in mind already. And more explicitly, um, the next time it was mentioned was a paper by, by McCullough and Fitz, which was very famous. So McCullough actually happened to have been MD. Fitz was more of a logician. And uh, so they wrote this famous paper, which is maybe the first explicit uh, uh, model of what the brain does. In fact, in some sense, this computational paradigm is so powerful that one can't even imagine anymore what happened before. So what did people think in the 20s and 30s about thinking about how the brain worked step by step? I don't know. Um, but so what they said is that, well, they had this paper where they find something like what we call a neural net. And then as a comment at the end, uh, they say one more thing. And their one more thing is that it's easily shown first that every net, this is what they had defined, can compute only such numbers as kind of Turing machine. 
Second, that each of the flatter numbers can be computed by such a net. So basically, they show that their mechanism was exactly the same as, as Turing's mechanism and a number, number, number of others. And um, so this is of interest as affording a psychological justification of the Turing definition of computability and its equivalence. That any number can be computed by an organism is computable by these definitions and conversely. So this is somewhat interesting. So I suppose by psychological, they identified their, th their net as what the brains do, what psychology achieves. And they said, well, wow, we, lo and behold, we get exactly the same notion of a mechanism uh, from our theory of psychology as Turing got from his, his various other, other notions. Um, it's also somewhat interesting that um, uh, you know, you, you usually, uh, so this is about seven years after Turing's paper, um, the fact that this phrase Turing machine is used already is rather surprising. You know, people you know, talk about Newton's laws and long after he hypothesized them, but already seven years afterwards, people talk about the Turing machine as if everyone should know what it was. Uh, so somehow this uh, notion of universal computation as being something which applied to kind of everything, um, all kinds of sciences, was pervasive immediately after it was discovered, which is rather, rather remarkable. Um, so on the other hand, um, of course, it's possible that this viewpoint isn't so useful, so it's possible that this viewpoint is evidently correct, but it may be just too, too general. Okay, so it's, so, so what, has, uh, what fruit has this approach uh, brought? Um, so, so basically what I want to persuade you is that um, progress has been slow because it's a difficult problem and uh, not because it's wrong. And I've spent a lot of time on this and I'll try to describe my approach to it. But of course, uh, it's, uh, other people pursue different approaches. And in particular, um, so neuroscience has a notorious reputation for actually disliking theories of any kind. So traditionally, um, so Kahal is the uh, maybe founder of modern neuroscience. Uh, he wrote his famous book called Advice to a Young Scientist, with a special chapter which is very negative on any theoreticians. Okay? Famously negative. You, sh you shouldn't read it. Um, but, uh, um, but okay, but just to, uh, to say to um, a, a different statement of the same thing. So this is uh, something I read a couple of decades ago um, by a Nobel laureate in, in biology. I won't name the person because I'm, I'm paraphrasing it and only from memory what he said, but apparently he believed this and many other pe people believe this as well. But this is what he said. The last thing we want is for, for biology to descend to depths of physics. The theoreticians tell the experimenters what to do. So, you know, so I'm mentioning this because this is, isn't an atypical view from uh, traditional biologists who really believe in working from observations up and believing that the theory, top down theorists don't have much to contribute. Um, and of course, it's for the top down theorists to justify what they're doing. You know, so it's an open problem. Um, but just to say how open the problem is, so for example, um, many, of us, many, many of us had, had breakfast this morning, and we could probably, probably remember what we had for breakfast. But how many neurons did we alter in making this memory? Was it one? Was it 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, a million? So no one has any idea. Okay, so neuroscience has been going on for a long time, and this very basic question, which a naive uh, person on the street may want to, an answer to, there isn't a remotest clue. And of course, you know, we want to know just, not just this answer, but actually you know, what happens when you make the memory, you know, how many neurons are involved, what, what happens, you know, so we don't know. So the field is very open, and uh, as far as, uh, so since we're discussing, we could be discussing either the past or the future, so this field is really one for the future because the most basic thing we don't know. Okay, so this is um, a suitable subject for our future research, so what I'm going to describe is, is my thoughts on it. Um, okay, so um, okay, so what I'm interested in is in uh, so the brain does many things. Um, you know, which thing am, am I interested in? So, so one of the most challenging things which uh, humans can do, the human brain can do, is symbolic processing. And by symbolic processing, I mean that I can just give you a long story and you kind of understand it. So, green fox. Um, then I tell you that, that in fact the green fox is the name of a restaurant. Why not? And 
I went there, it was a bad choice, and it was recommended by Joe, and I uh, was there when I heard the election results. And if I tell you this long story, um, you can understand it, you can adjust your brain to remember it. Uh, the question is what happens? Because you know, in a lifetime you've heard stories like this for a long time, you've remembered much of this, so what happened in your brain? Um, so, uh, so why I'm phrasing it like this is that if you ask how do you represent your breakfast, that's a very under-constrained under problem because there are thousands of ways it could be done. But if I say how can you do you know, hundreds, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of these acts in succession and still kind of remember earlier ones, that's a much more uh, hard, hard task to try to explain how the brain does and one should ask difficult challenging questions computationally to make it constrained, you see. So the general approach here is to show that the capabilities of the brain constrain what it could do um, severely, and then the rest of the unknowns you resolve by experiment. Okay, but just by, you know, if you find a computer on the beach, just by doing low-level experiments, you won't figure out what it's doing, but if you have some theories of what it may be doing, then maybe you can figure it out. Okay, so, um, so one very basic, of course, notion is chunking uh, from psychology, the idea that we can make a high-level concept as a compound of low-level ones. So if I tell you there's a restaurant called the Green Fox, then this Green Fox restaurant for you is like a basic concept. You can use it as a basic concept, which uh, is just like a primitive concept. You learn mathematics, you learn, you heap definitions on top of each other, and the high-level definitions are become, if you're an expert, become very basic notions to you like anything else. So that's a very one basic feature of, uh, of this. Um, okay, so, uh, so challenges to explain how Cortex could be doing hundreds of thousands of these in succession. Um, and uh, basically, uh, there's no, certainly there's no generally accepted theory of how it can be done, even in principle. So most theories just kind of break down because of the quantitative um, things. So what I'm going to describe is an approach which does give you a, a, a theory in principle, but it uh, badly needs validation by experiments. But as I'll try to explain at the end, uh, there, are by what, there are experimental techniques coming on stream which make some of these tests possible now, which they wouldn't have been earlier. Okay, so the so question is what do you do if there are no viable theories? So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there's some questions in science where there are 10 plausible theories and you need to do an experiment to see which one is true. But there are other, theory, other problems in science where there are no theories, okay? Nothing to test, okay? And, um, okay. and this, this is more in that category because, uh, you know, in many aspects of science, there are all kinds of these crazy books coming out by lay people, anything. Um, okay, but actually on, on explaining how the brain works, these books don't exist. So the, even bad speculations are, are very short, in short supply <laughs> for some reason. Okay. Um, okay, so what does a computer scientist do if there are no, no viable theories? Um, well, we start with a model and we make sure that it underestimates the brain. So we know the brain's complicated um, and uh, you know, try to explain, try to model it exactly in the sense of modeling where you're trying to model every aspect of it. That's hopeless. So we deliberately underestimate it so that at least if I can show something is doable on this model, no one will say, no, the brain cannot do it. Okay, so we make it simple. Um, and then we specify some set of multiple tasks to do. Um, so the hard thing is actually figuring out what computational task the brain does. I'll come back to that. Um, so we show that these tasks can be done uh, on this model, and uh, then the challenging thing is in fact show that sequences of thousands of these can also be done without degrading the early ones. So that's what's remarkable about human cognition, is that we can keep learning new stuff, and we don't degrade the early memories uh, too much. Okay. And this is, uh, so we have to challenge ourselves to explain something which is difficult. Um, so is there anything simple about the brain? Certainly, um, biologists emphasize that it's complicated. Okay, so is there anything simple which we can exploit as a, a theoretician? 
And uh, certainly there are, so one is that it's slow, so certainly each neuron has a very slow cycle time in the order of milliseconds. Um, and more, the point here is that it's very communication challenged, that um, each neuron is connected to a small fraction of the others. Uh, the influence of each neuron is probably small on, on, on the others. Um, so actually communication is rather stereotyped, that is pulses, so pulses seem to be all the same. Simple um, and also compared to computer, no one thinks there's a global addressing, so no one thinks that you can go to location 176, okay, which would make things much simpler. Um, but generally, the issue is that um, you're trying this regime is that you have these neurons, each connected to a small fraction of the others, and even the effect of any neuron on another is, is rather weak. Uh, that um, synaptic strengths. Um, okay, so let's uh, go on to um, get in more detail. So one very basic question about uh, uh, the human cortex is how strong are the influences of a cortex on um, of a neuron on another neuron? And we'll summarize it by a number k. And so k will be basically the number of neurons you need to excite to get to um, Plop together to cause another neuron to fire. So the question is, so a neuron may be connected to 10,000, maybe connected from 10,000 neurons. So how many of these neurons to which it's connected need to be firing to cause the target to, to fire? And on the average, it's believed to believe that each, each synapse is very weak. So typically, maybe you need 1,000 neurons to cause a neuron to fire. But if that was true everywhere, so K would be 1,000 uh, then. Okay. But um, if that was true everywhere, then the computation would be more, would be difficult. And just in human terms, you can imagine that, um, so a large K means that things are extremely democratic. So to make a decision about when this session ends, we all have to vote, okay? But another method is that one person tells us to stop, okay? Um, that, so if one person tells us to stop, that's K equals one. If, if you need to vote on everything, that's a large K. And if everything is so super democratic, it's hard to know how to organize a computation. It's much harder. Um, so this question of how democratic or undemocratic um, uh, neurons are is a very important question, which we, which we don't know the answer to. So basically, k equals 1 means that it's very Boolean. A single neuron can cause another neuron to fire. It's very Boolean, and that helps computation. If k is large, it, um, it, it makes it more difficult. And, uh, of course, uh, this distribution may differ for different species, for different parts of your cortex. It may differ in how, how educated you are, who knows? Okay, but, uh, so this isn't a trivial thing, but this will be a parameter of any, of any theory. Okay. So um, again, so I'm still interested in these kinds of computations. How do, how do you memorize things and learn about this kind of stuff? And so the basic question is, you know, what are the actual uh, tasks we're solving here? Okay, so computer science, you sort, you multiply matrices, what are the tasks here? And we do have to uh, make some assumptions. So, um, and also the, we need several basic tasks. A single one is, doesn't quite uh, cut it. Okay, so uh, two kinds of tasks. And one very basic kind of task is where you allocate storage to, to a new, new concept, like um, when you have this new restaurant you have to memorize. Chunky. Okay? And uh, so the first time you heard of Donald Trump, okay, so we need some concept which most of you have heard of um, as an example. And uh, so the uh, idea here is that I'm assuming, so here we're assuming this chunking notion that every time you, you remember a new concept, you do it by, as a combination of previous concepts. So this could be from his face, or in this case, maybe you do it from his name. You've heard Donald before. Heard the word Trump. First time you heard Donald Trump, you somehow say, "Oh yes, there's this new concept. I have to um, make a primitive out of it." And so we will make a, a computational, operational definition of what needs to be achieved when you do this. Um, so the task of, of memorization is that you already have two items already represented, A and B, and A will be Donald and B will be Trump. Your task is to find neurons somewhere for, uh, for the task C, uh, such that um, in the future, 
whenever you pair both A and B together, you will be reminded of C. Okay, so somehow you have to find neurons somewhere, somehow, for this new concept. And also you have to change your circuit so that whenever you hear of Donald and Trump, you will excite this new, this new set of neurons, okay? So this is a very generic definition. It doesn't achieve very, assume very much. But one thing it does assume is some sort of discrete representation. So I'm assuming that, um, say, Donald, you represent by a set of neurons. Okay. So um, this is consistent with, uh, okay, with some uh, experiments. Um, so this is very famous experiments um, done about 50, well, 10 to 50 years ago. So this is recording from a, a single cell in, in the human. And um, so you show a, a patient various pictures. And below the picture is the recording from the uh, activity of a single, of a single neuron. And this particular neuron, which is illustrated, whenever pictures of Bill Clinton were shown in the second line, this neuron was rather active. Whereas when other pictures were shown, the same neuron, neuron was, not, was not too active. And you know, could show other US presidents or Eiffel Tower or something else. Okay, so this is some confirmation that there's some notion that there's some discrete representation in the brain. A lot to discuss here, but certainly what I'm describing is consistent with this. And then I said there's several other operations you need. And so the second kind of operation is one where you relate concepts you've already stored. So here, you assume that Donald Trump you, you already have a representation for, and also that you know that elected president, you know what that means already. So there's no new concept to, to be stored, but you suddenly hear this news, hear this news, you have to update your mind so that your circuits are changed so that whenever you hear Donald Trump, you, you remember, oh yes, he's really elected president. Okay. Um, so again, you define it similarly that um, you have uh, um, stored items A and B, Donald Trump, elected president, and you have to do some stuff to change your circuits to um, make this happen. Okay. And uh, so, so generally, um, as it's, the general aim is that um, you want to celebrate various basic primitives, of which I've described two. There's also a uh, inductive learning one, uh, such that you can imagine that the more complex tasks of cognition are based on these. Okay? But a single primitive isn't enough. You need several to be plausible. Okay. So, uh, oops. Okay, so I do have a model of computation, which is similar to the color of bits, but it's, it's more programmable. Uh, but the main aspect of it is that I have these blue uh, parameters, n the number of neurons, d is the number of connections each neuron has, and k is the um, strength of the, of the synapses I've already mentioned. So I want this theory to be quantitative. Um, and the idea is that the number of neurons, the number of connections, and in fact synaptic strengths are all, all expensive resources. They need volume, and you're, you're short of volume in our head. And uh, these resources presumably are traded off rather, uh, rather carefully. Um, and there's timing. OK, so I won't go into, into this. Um, so the fourth parameters are, so how many, cons how many neurons do you use to represent breakfast? Is it 10? Is it a million? Um, we don't know. Okay, and uh, so what the, uh, um, the theory boils down to is some uh, <coughs> algorithmic explanation of how these tasks are possible. So, so basically, I've already told you all the uh, assumptions, and you just have to all the building blocks, and the rest you can you can work out. It's implied. So basically, we assume that you're probably really kind of a random-looking graph, and that as you learn stuff. You build up a circuit, sub-circuits inside, which achieve what we want to achieve. So, for example, if you want, whenever you hear Donald Trump, you want to be reminded that he was elected president, then uh, what do you need to do? Well, um, if A is uh, so, most nodes, most neurons are connected to very few other neurons. But if A is big enough, if there are enough Donald Trump neurons and enough elected president neurons, then there will be some connections between them statistically. 
Okay, so most neurons won't be connected to most others, but uh, there will be some connections. And in particular, what we'll need is that if, if you need k neurons to cause excitement at a, a target neuron, then for each of the many neurons you, you represent lecture present with, you'll need at least uh, k neurons in Donald Trump to cause it to fire. Okay, so if k is 10, for example, and you represent, you, you devote a million neurons to Donald Trump, then you don't need too many of those connections. But the point is that statistically, you can figure out um, if I give you the probability of connection, so D is the number of edges, and the number of neurons, and the strength of synapses, then there will be one value of R which works. Um, okay, so there are four parameters, and given an algorithm, uh, the four are related. If you define three, the fourth one will be implied. Um, okay, and uh, okay, so and for neuroscientists, uh, so the head, the head rule is a very basic primitive uh, notion in neuroscience, the idea that you know, you've got two neurons connected, and depending on the activity of the two neurons, uh, the um, connection will be strengthened or weakened. So in some sense, this primitive is like a systems level version of that. So we're saying that in the brain, the real primitive going on is that you've got big sets of neurons which represent concepts, and it's the joint activity of them all which, uh, which produces the, um, the results you want. So it's just single neurons by themselves that don't explain anything. Okay. Um, so we did some experiments, simulations of um, these mechanisms we have, and uh, it turns out that the synaptic strength is quite important. So for example, uh, part of your, so 10 to 8 neurons, this could be a, a chunk of, of a human brain, 8,000 connections per neuron, that's got some estimate, the number of connections. Um, so the K and the R, you have to guess, but they, they're related. So K16 means that you need 16 neurons to cause it. First have to neuron to fire. They're not absolutely strong. And what you get is that you need 360,000 neurons to represent the concept. And uh, th this is a large number, but in fact, this Bill Clinton cell experiment is kind of consistent with this. So this Bill Clinton cell experiment basically confirms that um, that there are many neurons are devoted to a single concept. It's surprisingly easy to find a neuron by poking a random electrode in, which represents some concept which you're interested in. Um, okay, but in fact, if you make this, the um, synapses stronger, k equals one, then we can do much larger sequences of, of actions. And so, you know, so so how many concepts does a human have to represent? Well. There are various estimates of expert knowledge, so in the Oxford English Dictionary, there are half a million words. Most people don't know them, know them all, but maybe there are hundreds of thousands of, of, of concepts which our brains uh, represent somehow. So you have to ex have explanations in that order. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. so as far as testing an experiment like this, so now there are possibilities of actually testing whether the neuron actually does this. Um, so what the theory says is that given a random set of neurons A and a random set of neurons B, say for Donald Trump and President, um, what we're saying is that if you stimulate A and B with some uh, uh, protocol, then the result will be that in future, when you stimulate A, then B will fire. You will have learned that Donald Trump is President. And this, in principle, you can, you can try to demonstrate it in, a, in, a, in brain tissue. Um, it's quite difficult. The difficulty is that in B, you're both uh, simulating it during training and you're also recording it from it from while, you're, while testing. So this is a kind of experimental technique which is now possible with uh, optical methods, but it wasn't possible uh, earlier. And, uh, okay. and so just to summarize, uh, so as far as testing such a theory, um, number two is what I just mentioned. Um, as far as testing the uh, um, strength of synapses, a very promising approach is connectomics, where people slice up brains and try to determine the statistical uh, facts about brains, how many connections, how strong the synapses. Um, so that's a possible approach. Now, none of these are easy. 
And then lastly, the third experimental approach is uh, imaging. Uh, so there's one imaging technique, MEG, which has very good uh, time resolution. So it's got time resolution of one or two milliseconds, which is somewhat the rate at which neurons work. And so if you're familiar with some of these experiments in imaging, that if you, uh, if you think of the, of the word hammer, then there's some um, signature of the word hammer in your brain, because when you think of the word hammer, you stimulate the neurons in your motor cortex, which try to hammer something. So concepts generally have some signatures in your cortex, and you can see it in this, uh, in, in this you can detect it from imaging. And with the MEG technique, you can potentially do this dynamically. So if I interpret a complicated scene, then um, I can potentially uh, figure out what algorithm is being used to, to do that. So these are just three experimental opportunities which are available, coming on stream now, for doing experiments which would be of interest and to test or validate this kind of theory. And uh, that this is what makes this a like, very good time to pursue this area, I think. So uh, thank you.